Hey Don, this is my uh, little informal recording since I'm having a hard time doing the phone call. Plus I figured it might be actually good to have this recorded. I'm going <clears> to <throat> just walk you through how to digitize a pump curve. Um, and basically these techniques would apply to any type of curve that I might or anybody might ask you to do. I think this will be really handy for people and I know I'll use it a lot. It'll be sort of sporadic like um, get a job and I'll need five or six things digitized <clears throat> but I really think you know, showing you how to do this will really help me a lot, a lot out that way and as people realize you know this I suspect this will happen more and more um, so uh, I guess as a starting point uh, what what we're going to do maybe just to familiarize you with it a little bit we're going to digitize some pump curves um, and these are, there's sort of two different formats the pump curves come in. Um, and so this is one format. <clears throat> and, and basically the pump curve, it, it just talks about how the pump, you know, pumps produce, move water and produce pressure. And this is just a plot of how much water they're moving and at what pressure they're, you know, moving it at. And these are different impeller sizes, which sort of controls what the pump can do. Um, it's kind of like the merry-go-round at the playground, to be honest with your kids. You, know, you put the kid in the middle of the merry-go-round, spin, spin the, uh, the merry-go-round, and the kid gets flung to the side, you know, and they giggle, and hopefully if you don't barf if you don't do it too much. But um, the pump does the same thing. The water goes in the center of a disc called an impeller, and it gets flung out to the sides, and this is just the performance curve for it. Um, so... And when when I give you something like this, I'll mark it up and say I want you to plot these impeller lines and these brake horsepower lines and these efficiency lines, so you know what to pick up. Um, but I just thought it might help you to have a little bit of a feel for 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 what <clears throat> what a pump curve you know looks like and what I'm asking you to do. Um, in this format, they plot everything as like constant efficiency, constant impeller size. Uh, constant brake horsepower um, and net positive suction head all on the same set of axes. There, there's another way to do that that, that looks like this. Um, and uh, let's see here, how do I zoom in? There we go. And uh, in this presentation, essentially, this is head. All of the horizontal axes on this are flow. Um, but they break the curves up, they plot the impeller curves and efficiency curves on, on this set of axes against head. They plot net positive suction feet on a separate axis and power on a separate axis. And again, I'll just tell you, I'll tell you what to do with each curve set that I send you. But I just thought it might help you to be familiar a little bit. So, um, basically to get started, um, let me minimize this. There we go. Um, first thing you want to do is just sort of do a little bit of organizational stuff. You want to create a file folder um, for the pump um, and then some subfolders under that file folder, like one subfolder for each line type I'm going to have you plot. So for instance, I'll, we'll demonstrate this using this pump curve right here. And so <clears throat> this is a, a, I happen to know it's Bell and Gossett, I would tell you that, but it's a Bell and Gossett series 1510, 1.5 AC, um, 1.5 AC, 1750 RPM pump. So I actually would name the folder that. So let's just go make a little folder. Um, I have a place I keep these things on my on my uh, on my computer. So I'm going to make a folder called Bell and Gossett. 1510 was the model number, and then uh, and that's up at the top of the page. And then, um, oops, I to click back in the name there. Dang it. There we go. 1510, one space, one, and you can't use a backslash line, so I'll use 1.5 AC 1750RPM. So that's what I'm going to name the folder. And that's handy because, say I want to use this 
two years from now, I can just do a search and find it by the pump make and model. So it just makes it easy to locate it. So in that folder, what you want to do is you make a subfolder for each of the each of the line types I'm going to have you digitize. So for this curve, we're going to digitize the impeller impeller lines. We're going to digitize the efficiency lines. We're going to digitize the brake horsepower lines. And we're going to digitize the net positive suction head. Fine. Okay. Um, okay, so now we've got that set up. Um, so now we actually would go ahead and open up that little you know digitizing application. And I have it open with a different curve. So I'm going to open up. Oh, before I close that, the other thing I like to do is put the actual original of the pump curve that I'm using into that folder so I have the original. So I'm going to save this file to that folder. So file, save as a PDF, and I want to save it to, um, and this would, you know, the folder can be wherever you want to put it on your computer. I just have it, you know, I have a little it makes sense to me, but maybe no one else type organization system. Where I'm going to put this. So I'm just going to save the original curve there. And, and usually when you get this stuff it'll be like a PDF. And, and one thing you have to do before you can work with it in that little plot digitizer is convert it to an image file. And, and there's a couple ways you could do that. Um, one is in Adobe, you can literally say file, save, and instead of picking PDF, you go down here to image and pick JPEG. And, you know, so I'll just put it in that same place. Um, so I can say save. And there it goes. Um, another way um, to get an image from something, just, you know, so you know about it. Out of Adobe, you can actually say edit and then take a snapshot and you get this little crosshair thing you just sort of drag the crosshair over what you want to capture and when I let go um, when I let go of the mouse button it says the selected area has been copied so now it's on my clipboard so the problem is how do I get that converted to a JPEG and there's a bunch of ways to do that the easiest one that I know of is I um, I open up PowerPoint and I'm just gonna I'm gonna make a blank presentation to show the whole thing so I'm just gonna open PowerPoint I'm going to make a blank presentation. I'm going to uh, make sure I, this slide has the title, so I want a blank slide, so I'm going to say layout blank. I'm going to click into that slide and I'm going to say paste bitmap. So there's that thing that Adobe just you know copied for me. And the way you get it to be a image file is if you right click on this, oops, if you right click on it, um, and one of the things PowerPoint lets you do is save something as a picture. So you right click, pick save as a picture, um, navigate to the folder you want to put it in. Um, and then um, I I work with JPEGs a lot, so I pick that format, and I know that format, image format, works with the digitizer. So you would just pick that format, and then say save. You could name it whatever you want. I'm not going to worry about saving it because I already have a copy. I just wanted to show you that technique. And then the other technique, um, say you don't have the fancy version of Adobe, you just have the reader. Um, another way to do this basically is to do a screenshot. So you press Control, Alternate, Print Screen. And that basically captured the, screen, the image on the screen. And then it's, from there on, it's the same thing. You, you put a new slide, get a blank slide. You say Paste, Bitmap, and there it is again. Except um, if I zoom out on this a little bit, oops, out. what you'll see, the difference is not only did I get the the area that I wanted I got the whole 
you know, screen that was in that window. So the bottom line is you need to have an image file for this plot digitizer to work, and there's a couple ways for you to get that created. Um, and those are handy to know for other things too. So having said that, let's go ahead and um, open up the, uh, the little digitizer tool, and I'll show you how you go about digitizing a couple of the line types. Um, let's see here. So I already have it open. It's this little Java icon, and and we I want a different curve though. I want it. I want to do that Bell and Gossett curve. So I'm going to say File. I'm going to say Open. I'm going to navigate to where that curve is. Bumps. Digitize bump curves. And I'm going to pick that Bell and Gossett image. Now you got to pick the image. You can see all that stuff, but if you try to pick the PDF, it won't open it. You just get a blank screen. So you want to pick the image. Say Open. Okay, so now it opened that in a new window. So now we want to maximize it. Um, and we need to get this zoomed to where um, you want it as big as possible, but you need to be able to see the whole curve. And so I'm going to try just sort of at random here, see what. I guess maybe uh, I haven't tried zooming. Um, the other one can't. The one I've used this has been the right size. So there, 75% looks like it'll work. Um, so in and out, let you do that. I guess you don't have the option of picking the zoom. So you want to get it as big as possible, but so you can see the entire curve. So now we can use the scroll bars to move us down to our curve of interest. Okay. So this is the curve we want, the one and a half inch AC. Sometimes there's multiple pumps on one page. And so to digitize this, um, and there, notice down here it actually leads you through the little steps. So first thing it wants us to do is choose the most negative end of the x-axis. So I just, you know, real carefully, you know, and the, the, this is only as precise as you are in clicking. So the, you know, the more precise you are, the better. And you'll notice how the crosshairs turn white when they're over a black line, so that tells me I'm pretty much on that line. So I'm going to click that. And when the x-axis is there, it's a zero. And I want to use that same point for the minimum axis of the y value. There's a checkbox there, so I say OK. And it says the minimum value for the y-axis, and most of the time, but not always, it'll be zero. It'll be the same thing. So you say zero. And now it says choose the most positive end of the x-axis. So we just go out this way to the 210. We do the same thing you know, very carefully, or you know, don't don't be stupid about it, but you know, just as carefully as you can, pick that point. And so that value right there is 210. So we put that in. And um, you notice also you can um, use a log scale, and you can use the exact same calibration for y. We will use this sometimes, not for pump curves. We'll seldom use that, just so you know. And so we say OK. And now it's saying choose the most positive end for the y-axis. So we'll do the same thing uh, for there. And it says, what's that value? And it's 60. And be careful you. Um, Carefully, you don't jump axes. Notice this this has dual axes. This is in meters and this is in head. And down here it's gallons per minute. And if I scroll down, you see liters per second. Make sure you're using consistent units. Um, so the x-axis name, I would just call it flow in gallons per minute. And it's not very critical. I mean, I can always change this in the spreadsheet when I load it. But you know, giving it a name that's something like what the axes are is always a good idea. So say flow in uh, gallons per minute. And it asks us the y-axis name and it's total oops, total head in feet. Okay. So now we're to the point where we're ready to digitize. Now notice as I put those axes in you can actually see a light red line with the scaling factors we used on the x-axis and a light blue line with the scaling factors we used for the y-axis. So it's starting to show up. 
So now, all this program really does is as you click on a dot, it's basically just counting pixels, the little dots on the screen that make, make the picture. And so it's basically setting up coordinates based on the units that you entered using pixel counts. That's what it's really doing. So let's just digitize the biggest impeller curve to show you how that works. So um, the way you do that is you literally just start clicking on the line. And the more dots you make, the more precise it is. But for most cases, it's a, if the line's only gradually changing slope, like what I typically do for the impeller curves is I click it on every grid crossing and then if it doesn't quite cross a grid or just goes past it, I'll click at the, at the end. And so I'm going to start here and then go there and there and there So, um, pretty darn exciting, isn't it? This is really exciting, technically, actually, to be able to do this. Um, and what it means I can do in the time it saves and stuff. So there, I'm at the end of the line. You'll notice it drew a little yellow line where I clicked. So, once I get there, and if you screw that up, all you do is you, you do the same procedure, just re-digitize that line and don't save what you just did. But that looks pretty good to me, so I'm going to save it. So I'm done. So I go up here, I click done. Now, down here, when you do that, you think, well, what changed? Well, nothing changed really, but if you go down to the little Java applet, now there's two window, a third window. Those are the points you just picked. Um, and one edit you can make, your first point on this pump curve is always going to be zero. The reason this is a negative point 1, 8 is because I didn't exactly click that dot exactly vertically in line with my zero. So you can just zero that out. That's the only adjustment you'll have to make. Everything else is good enough. So now we got that zeroed out. We want to save this information. So this is the impeller line for a 7 inch impeller. Okay, that's what the 7.0 means. So I'm going to say file. I'm going to say save as. I'm going to navigate to the that while we're in there because that's where I opened this file from. Except now I want to put this in the impeller line folder, and I'm going to call the file 7.0 because that's what it is, and say save. Now, if we go to that folder and look at what what just happened. Now there's a little comma separated value file in there. Um, that's what CSV stands for. And what that means is, like, if, if I want to bring data into Excel to make a graph, I need it to be, I need each data point to be in a separate cell so I can do that. Um, and if we open this file in a text editor, which I'm gonna, I'm gonna do just to show you. So I'm going to use Notepad, that's a text editor. If you look close at this, you'll notice the data we have, there's the zero, then there's a comma, and then there's 52.4896, and then there's a comma, and then there's a carriage return. And then there's another number, and a comma, and another number. When, when I open this in Excel, which I'll show you in a minute, what the little computer's brain is doing is it's reading all these numbers and letters and it doesn't know them from diddly squat, but it recognizes things like carriage returns. And if in the, the process, you know, in the, in the process of order, opening this file in Excel, if you tell it it's a comma separated value file, it'll read all this stuff and put it in, that'll all end up in one cell. That'll all end up in one cell. But when it gets to this zero, It'll put this, the carriage return, you know, causes it to go to a new line. So it'll put this all in one cell. It'll come to here and it'll read the zero, put it in the first cell, and it'll see the comma, and the little computer brain will say, oh, wow, that's the only thing they want in that cell. I better move over a cell. So it'll move over another cell, and then it'll put the 52.4896 in that cell, and it'll see another comma and say, whoa, that's the end of that cell. 
and it'll go over to the third cell and then it'll say what's next and it'll say oh there's a carriage return so I need to move down a row and then it just keeps doing that so that's the comma is what tells Excel how to they call it parse the data out um, you can there's also you know people do it with tabs people will do it with colons it's called a delimited file in the in the general case so that's a comma separated value file is a type of delimited file and this is a little bit than you need to know to actually to digitize the pump curve but you seem interested in these things and it might be helpful for you to know these things which is why I bring it up so I'm just going to close this so if we open Excel and try to open that file and see what happens, let's just do that. So I'm going to go File, I'm going to say Open, I'm going to navigate to that folder. Now, um, I'm going to show you something. I have this, when you, by default, Excel does not have the All Files filter picked, by default, Excel will be looking for all Excel files. In other words, if you had just freshly launched Excel and started doing this, the filter right here would be all Excel files. The reason I bring that up is, watch what happens. When I click into this break course power lines, oops, sorry, impeller lines folder, it's like, well, there's no files there. But I thought we were just there and there were files. Well, if we compare that, there actually is a file there. And the reason we aren't seeing it is because Excel is filtering for only files with the .xl, .xls, etc. If I change that to all files, now that file shows up. So I bring that up because in the past I have been banging my head against the wall. Why does the file show up here and not there? Well, that's because the filter is turned on. So just something to know about. So if I open this file, and again, you won't have to do this. Oh, it, it actually didn't parse it because I've done this. I'm going to shut down Excel and go through that procedure again just to so you get the full meal deal with it. Or actually, I'll create a new instance of Excel and do it that way. Okay, so now, say File, Open. I'm going to navigate to the folder where the pump curves are. Okay, so there I have the problem, but it's because of this filter. I change the filter to all files. There's my 7-inch impeller line, and I click on it. Well, I'll, oh, I know. It'll, it'll automatically parse comma-separated value files. I'm so, this is what happens when I do the informal thing. I sort of get ahead of myself a little bit. I'm going to do one other thing here to show you, show you something. Um, I'm going to navigate to that folder, and I'm going to copy this but I'm going to make it a text file. Um, and like a CSV file can be a text file but a text file can't be a CSV file from Excel's perspective. So now if I go and try and open that file in Excel it's like if I say file open and I try to open this file this will Excel will say I don't quite know what to do with this which is the point I was trying to make um, open so now Excel it recognizes that it's not a normal Excel file and so it's saying was this delimited somehow is there commas is there tabs or do you just want to tell me where the where the rows are if I pick fixed width and I say next if all my data was perfect like it was you know, three numbers, a decimal point, three more numbers, and a comma. I could say, well, I want to break the columns there, I want to break the columns there. So I could do that. But if I had data where it was one number, a decimal point, and three numbers, then ten numbers, a decimal point, two numbers, I couldn't really do it because it wouldn't line up. That's the real advantage of a delimited file. So if I go back and say, well, this is actually delimited data, say next it says well is it tab delimited is it what's what's the delimiter what's the thing that tells me when to stop putting stuff in one cell and move over and this is commas we know that so if I pick commas notice how it now has broken that data up for me very cool 
and if I say next, I could format stuff, but I usually just accept, you know, the default formats because I can fix that later. And then I say finish, and there everything is. Now you notice this number is in a separate cell from this number. This is in a separate cell from this number, even though if we open up that text file and take a look, 0 and 52 are all in one line, but here they're in separate cells. Okay. In contrast, total head and feet, flow, GPM, that whole line there, since there's no commas in it, if I click in this cell, that's where all of it ended up. Okay. So that's sort of how a comma delimited comma delimited file works. And again, that's a little more than you need to know to digitize this pump curve. But again, you seem curious about this stuff, so I thought I'd show you. And the other reason I showed you is once you get comfortable with the actual digit digit digitalization part, I can show you how to actually get that data into the spreadsheet to where it's even faster for me or whoever to work with it. In fact, once you get used to that, I can show you how to even get it to where it shows up as the curve, which you know then means it's ready for us to you know do our magic and with. Um, so I just thought we'd take it in baby steps and see where your interest level sort of started to wane. But this first step is really helpful. If this is all you ever care to do, this will be helpful, the whole digitalization thing. So getting back to that for a minute. So we just digitized this line right here. Now let's 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 pick up an efficiency curve, like one of these these percentage curves. Let's pick up one of those. So to do that, all you have to do is, like it says here, press digitize. So I press digitize, and I keep the axis names. And then I just follow this curve. Now, a curve that has a sharper turn to it, you're going to have to pick more data points than we did. So you know what you really want is you want that little yellow line to now I'm just going to intentionally make a mistake you want that little yellow line to closely follow the black line and the more dots you make the closer it'll be but clearly I could have done better than that okay um, so there's functions that let you insert points but you can't move them so when I mess up like that, I usually just start over again. In other words, I say done, but I don't save it. Like I say done, I go to this little window and I just close it without saving it. And then I say digitize and I just start over again for that line. So I go And that looks pretty good to me, so I'm going to say done. I'm going to go to that little chart. And now you don't make any corrections because this is out in the middle, and so it's going to have odd coordinates. The only correct time you can correct is you know this one should be zero for the y value, the starting point of these impeller lines. Other than that, you just take what you get. And I say file, and I say save as. But now the difference is, instead of an impeller line, this is an efficiency line. So I'm going to put it here, and it's a 70% efficiency line, so I'm going to call it, you know, 70. That simple. Save. Okay, now I'm done with that. So you, you know, would just do that same procedure for all the lines I ask you to, like, to digitize. I'll, I'd probably, on this curve, ask you to do the impeller lines, the efficiency lines, the brake horsepower lines and then that positive suction headlines. Um, and one, one little caveat, if, if you had one of the other curve types, so I'm going to close this and go back to that other window. So if you had this curve type, remember how uh, this had the net positive suction headline started on a, on a different axis? than these. Well, to get that not net positive suction headline, you'd actually have to re 
start over again with the total process and re so you only had a y-axis scale for this curve of 0 to 30 instead of a y-axis scale of 0 to 120. So if you had a curve like this you'd actually have to open it up three times once to pick up these, close it, once to pick up this by rescaling the axis actually Yeah, you can't. I don't think there's a way to rescale the axis once you've once you've done this. I'm learning about this program still too. Yeah, it looks like so you'd have to pick everything up off of one axis, close it, open the curve up again, set up a new set of axes, and pick up this curve, close it. If I ask you to pick up that curve, open it again, set up a new set of axes, and pick up this curve. So. Um, hopefully that, that's enough to get you going. I'm going to end here and then I will um, send you this and uh, some curves to get you started. And uh, you know, feel free to call with questions or you know, comments or if you need me to go through this in person, we can do that too. Um, anyway, just let me know. And uh, thanks for taking this on. It really, really does help. And that's it.